good evening everyone the meeting is about to start i request everyone to be seated kindly put your mobiles on silent mode please Good evening everyone my name is Ram Jetty i am the vice chair of 24th congress and international union of crystallography on behalf of loc i take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to all the distinguished guests dignitaries media personnel students and all other for their gracious presence on this occasion more than 10 years of planning has gone into this event and we are very happy to see all of you here May this event become something to be recalled with much joy and nostalgia to the years to come. To begin this program, I take pleasure in welcoming, inviting Professor Marvin Hackett, President IUCR, Professor Mike Glazer, Vice President IUCR, Dr. R. Chidambaram, Vice Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, Professor Tom Blundell, University of Cambridge, Professor Gautam Desiraju, Chair, 24th Congress, on to the stage for the traditional lamp lighting ceremony. very much all of you you may please take your seats I now invite Professor Desraj to deliver his welcome address. <laughs> Professor Desraj, I, I invite to deliver his welcome address. Dear friends, on behalf of the local organizing committee of the 24th Congress and General Assembly of the International Union of Crystallography, I welcome you all.
this is a truly international gathering here are the 58 countries that belong to the union and here are the 73 countries that are represented in this meeting it is nice to see that there are quite a few countries represented here even though they are not members of the union the spread of our subject is now truly worldwide here are the 10 countries with the maximum attendance in the congress it is a matter of pleasure for me to record here that the Indian scientific community is so well represented in this 24th Congress with 514, 514 registered participants. <laughs> For this, I must thank, I must thank the Science and Education Research Board of the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, for their handsome contribution that alone could have made this possible. So thank you, SERB. <laughs> and here are the 16 countries who have sent a single representative each to this Congress. All countries are equally important, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to note that we have representation from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Cameroon, and from Myanmar. We have been active in securing the participation of as large a number of people as possible from South and Central America and from Sub-Saharan Africa. I am pleased to see all of you here. The BRICS initiative is an important one in science nowadays. These five seemingly diverse countries have a number of common issues and challenges. The positives and negatives of doing science in BRICS nations also seem to match in an uncanny way. Strange. But talking to people from these other four BRICS countries, there are many, many things we seem to have in common. We have a special session in the coming days on the challenges of doing science in these countries. A special welcome to the 30 scientists and students from our giant neighbor to the Northeast. The participation of Chinese scientists in the Hyderabad Congress is significantly higher than in our previous Congresses, and I trust that this trend will continue. A very special mention must be made of the Austrian contribution to this meeting. In terms of the number of speakers and posters, as compared to previous Congresses, and of course, most notably because of the presence here of the giant model of the sodium chloride crystal structure that is the creation of a young man from that country, Dr. Robert Crickle, who is here with us today. I will also acknowledge the presence here 
of 26 registered participants from Canada and 17 from the Czech Republic, our predecessor and successor in this giant venture that the IUCR Congress has now become. But in the end, ladies and gentlemen, we forget about countries when we are in a meeting such as this. See what one of our founding fathers had to say on this matter. The greatness of science is that it is truly international, even as the ways of doing it and perhaps the ways of thinking about it may change from country to country. In fact, I'm fairly sure that in different countries with different cultural and social mores, we think about science in a slightly different manner. But what we do in the, in the end is, must be the same, it must be to the same end. I now come to my home country. It is not a country. It has been called a subcontinent by many. Critics and wags have even termed it a mere concept an idea. In truth, it is not quite demarcated by geographical and political borders. Even as we must follow these concepts in today's world of nation states. Look at its size. The intent of this map is fully clear and the states of our union are shaded with the flag of the countries whose entire population matches just one of these states. It is a nice coincidence, though, that the population of the small state of Telangana, in which Hyderabad is located, just about matches the population of Canada. So we have sort of moved from Canada to another kind of Canada. And look at this. We enjoy all the advantages of multilingualism and we have 22 official languages in this country and this includes English, by the way, with literally hundreds of variations and dialects. Yes, as I said, we respect political borders, we must. And some of these are quite contentious today in our immediate proximity. But as you can see from this map, language respects no borders. We had a large province in undivided India called Bengal. In 1947, this was partitioned. The western part came to India. The eastern one eventually become, became Bangladesh in 1971. I visited Dhaka for the first time last December and I was struck by its similarity to Calcutta. And it was very heartening that people on both sides of this border are always aware of the positive aspects of life on the other side. It is indeed a pleasure to note that as many as 19 people from Bangladesh are here in this meeting, including, yes, three of the student volunteers. Yes, these three, the volunteers are identified by these grey t-shirts and saffron coloured caps that nobody else wears. So three of these people are young lads from Bangladesh who have come here and they're going to work with the volunteers from India. So as I said, science, it doesn't respect all these artificial distinctions. And finally, <laughs> we come to the city where this meeting is being held. I will uh, necessarily be subjective because I spent happy, 30 happy and significant years of my own scientific life in Hyderabad. Hyderabad is right in the center of our country. It is a meeting place of languages, cultures and religions and dare I say diets. 
They say that as you travel from the south of our country to the north, Hyderabad is the place where the coffee becomes so bad that you have to start drinking tea. <laughs> but then, of course, I speak as a South Indian. Uh, let us come to the Congress itself now. Many of the things you will see will be very well known to those who have come to our Congress before. For those of you who are here for the first time, in India that is, and the Congress, I envy you, for you will see things that you have never experienced before. For all of you, there are new ideas that are being tried out here for the first time in an IUCR Congress. You will see e-posters, and because of this, the physical posters will be displayed for just one day rather than two. E-abstracts are linked to the IUCR journals, which are all free access from within HICC during this meeting. A quiz on the app is something that all of you should attempt. There will be a small number of questions every day, starting today for seven days. And yes, there will be prizes for the best answers. These will be given out at the closing ceremony. Nine special activity micro symposia cover topics that are of particular interest to the union itself and are marked with a special color code in the program book that you have. The parallel program is another new innovation and consists of a number of science-related subjects that do not fit into the traditional program format of our congresses, but is just about as important if one wants a larger appreciation of what crystallography is all about. Some meetings of the regional associates are also being held in the parallel program slots rather than in the usual lunchtime slots. The parallel program and the special activity micro symposia are being held in the same time slots. And the parallel program is good, believe me. So people in the micro symposium better give good talks if you don't want people going away and sitting in the parallel program. You have a choice of attending 10 possible events, nine micro symposia and one parallel program during those two slots. The 24th Congress owes a sincere debt of thanks to the members of the International Program Committee who have given a valuable part of their time to produce a magnificent program that will unfold from tomorrow morning. Many of us know that when one offers to serve on the IPC of an IUCR Congress, one is foregoing a speaking opportunity. Most of the IPC members are still, however, with us in Hyderabad today, and I do appreciate this. You will be seeing many of them as chairs of the keynote lectures beginning tomorrow. I finally come to this small group of extremely hardworking, innovative, and resourceful persons. And I refer, of course, to the local organizing committee on whose behalf I am welcoming you here. Most of you know some of these people at least, and this is the opportunity to get to know all of them. I do believe that big meetings are most effectively run by small committees of like-minded people. And this has been my happy experience in chairing the LOC for the 24th Congress. I thank you all very much for your kind attention. Namaskaram. It is a special pleasure to have Dr. Chidambaram here with us today. While he is the principal scientific advisor to our government, we are even happier that he will be able to speak in the capacity of a former vice president of IUCR. Some of you will recollect his notable contributions in the area of neutron crystallography in the 1960s. Sir, we feel extremely honored for your gracious presence here. Now I am delighted to invite Dr. Chidambaram onto stage and deliver the message. Distinguished uh, participants in this 24th IUCR Congress, 
friends and colleagues. I join uh, Dr. Desiraju in welcoming all of you here, particularly those who have come from abroad. And I must also thank uh, Dr. Desiraju for inviting me to this opening ceremony. And I'm particularly happy that my alma mater, the Indian Institute of Science is organizing this Congress, though it is in Hyderabad rather than in Bangalore. Added pleasure is that Sir Thomas Leon Blundell from the University of Cambridge is getting the prestigious award prize and I think he'll be giving us a lecture in this opening session. We have been waiting for a long time for the Congress to come to India. I think we almost got the 2014 Congress because of the strenuous efforts of Dr. M. Bijan, President of the Indian Crystallographic Association at that time. I think that invitation was considered in the IUCR Congress General Assembly in 2008. We are also proud that Dr. Gautam Desi Raju from India was the president during 2011 and 14. Before that, one of our pioneering crystallographers, Dr. S. Ramaseshan, was the vice president during 1981-84. I myself held that post during 96-99 and of course was in the executive committee for six years before that. And I must mention that the meetings of the executive committee were always cordial and productive. I have been in many committees, but the one IUCR executive committee, I think somehow the, the, the ambience was very, very pleasant and the stay was more enjoyable if the meeting was held in the headquarters, Wall City of Chester. Though I do understand that maybe it may move out from there, I'm not sure. That's what I've been hearing. In the IUCR website, there is an excellent article on crystallography in India, starting with the reference to Dr. K. Banerjee, who laid the foundation for the development of direct methods, apart from other work that he did. The pioneering biophysicist, Professor G. N. Ramachandran, famous for his work on conformation of proteins and for the ubiquitous Ramachandran plot used by all protein crystallographers today. Dr. A. R. Verma, Dr. S. Ramasishan, and others. I remember attending every IUCR Congress from 69 Stony Brook to 99 Glasgow. And in a IUCR Congress, apart from the important plenary talks, and keynote lectures, that is this feature of a large number of excellent and very useful microsymposia covering a large range of fields, which is somewhat unique, I think, among the ICS unions. Of course, there are sessions and symp but the very organized way these microsymposia are organized in the IUCR Congress is a particularly important feature. Skimming through the program for this Congress, I find that the emphasis among the microsymposia is also on instrumentation, on synchrotron radiation sources, the new kind of X-ray sources, on our new measuring and analysis techniques. I must mention here that the Indian 2.5 GeV synchrotron radiation source at Indore, Rajaramana Center for Advanced Technology, Indus 2, is working extremely well and its use is growing rapidly. Access to outside SRSs for Indian crystallographers is easy now through several mechanisms. For example, you can, DST provides their use in project mode. Building and owning a beamline instrument, the powder and surface diffraction instrument at the photon factory in Sukuba. Building a beamline instrument in collaboration the macromolecular crystallography and high pressure diffraction instrument at Electra, Trieste. Buying access to the macromolecular crystallography beamline in ESRF through the Department of Biotechnology. Access to the new SRS Petra 3 at Hamburg 
by paying for building and maintaining one beam line. This is again through the Department of Science and Technology. There are also discussions going on about building a next generation SRS in India, for which we welcome suggestions from our friends abroad. The easy availability of supercomputers, of large data storage systems and the internet, provide opportunities as never before of manipulating, storing and accessing big data. In fact, we now talk about data explosion and data deluge. In the case of genomics, the size of the genomic database, I understand, almost doubles every year. Big data in crystallography, particularly macromolecular crystallography, I'm sure will be discussed in more than one micro symposium or plenary lecture, keynote lecture in this Congress. A last comment, material science and crystallography are closely linked. As I look at the topics of the micro symposia, many of them could as well have been in the conference in this in the conference on of the materials research society. Most advances in science today are driven by the discovery of new materials or by modifying old materials for a needed function and the development of new processes to make them. This is true for electronic materials as much as for biological materials. And here, the knowledge of the structure of the materials and the defects in the materials help. That is why crystallography is such an important, though as someone said, sometimes rather invisible field. I'm sure the deliberations in this Congress will be very useful and help young crystallographers in particular to develop their ideas and nucleate new research problems and collaborations. I wish the Congress all success. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your message. Science and Engineering Research Board of the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, informally known as SCRB SERP, has been instrumental in facilitating a participation of a large number of Indian scientists and students at this meeting through a very handsome financial grant. Dr. Raju Sharma, who is the Secretary of SERP, he is here, here with us today. I take this opportunity to invite Dr. Raju Sharma onto the stage and say a few words. A very good afternoon to you all, uh, the distinguished uh, guests and the participants to the 24th Congress and the General Assembly of IUCR. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this opening ceremony. Uh, see, such a large gathering, over 1,700 uh, participants and uh, with about 73 countries, actually. So where can I get this, such an opportunity to talk about the SCRB programs? So I like to actually uh, take this opportunity to talk a little bit about our activities, actually. Now, Science and Engineering Research Board, it's an autonomous body of government of India, which is actually funding the, all the extramural uh, research in uh, India. It's one of the major agencies actually which provide this support. It's a model almost like a National uh, Science Foundation of the US, but of course a little bit smaller than this. Uh, we have a budget of about $125 million equivalent money in India. Now we support a large spectrum of Indian scientists actually through our various programs, uh, which covers actually again a different type of uh, mix of the programs. We, ha we have actually like uh, fellowships actually for young scientists, we have early career research awards, we have actually extramural support for scientists, then fellowship for the scientists actually who are very active actually. Uh, so all those, port uh, that, that portfolio actually uh, provides a large spectrum uh, of uh, scientists actually. Uh, I'd like to mention actually the number actually like uh, last year we have supported approximately 400 projects in various categories uh, in India. And as almost similar number of fellowships we have provided to the post, uh, post fellows and early career research award. 
Now, all this gathering is uh, uh, during this gathering. I like to mention two particular programs where I am looking for a lot of actually participation from foreign scientists. Uh, recently, the Science and Engineering Research Board has launched two new programs. One is called Bajra, that is actually visiting advanced joint research awards, where actually we are inviting foreign scientists to come to India and uh, of work there directly for uh, one month to three month duration in uh, collaboration with some local institute. And we will be covering actually approximately $15,000 for the first month and $10,000 for the next two months. We expect to actually improve the quality of our research work as well as the linkages actually we want to post, uh, promote actually through this. The second program we are going to launch very soon, that is the uh, for carrying out the joint research work actually, through what we call actually VJI Core. This is Virtual Joint uh, International Center of Research Excellence, where at least one institute from India and one from abroad should be involved. Uh, it, if required, actually, it can be maybe several countries actually they can uh, join together. And we will be supporting mobility. Uh, it may be exchange of students, exchange of faculties, exchange of ideas through networking seminars. So those type of programs actually would be uh, covering it. Uh, so uh, I'll, I won't go actually much into much details. Again, I'd like to thank you very much actually, and we really are proud of uh, to be associated with this international event which is happening in India after a lot of efforts as Dr. Chidambaram has mentioned. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward actually to all your collaboration, and uh, I am hoping that many linkages will be forged during this conference also. and. Uh, we look forward to some of the proposals actually coming to our uh, SERV programs also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, kindly, uh, I request once again, you please come on to the stage. I also invite uh, Professor Hackert, Dr. Michael Hines, and Dr. Robert Crickle onto the stage. One of the highlights of the 20, this 24th Congress is the appearance of the world's largest crystal structure model in this venue. The model was the creation of Dr. Crickel, who is from Austria. Dr. Heinz is the director for the Austrian Culture Forum for Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. The ACF and SERB have together sponsored this transportation of this model from Vienna to Hyderabad. Now I request Professor Hacker to do a virtual unveiling of the sodium chloride model on stage. I request all of you once again to take your seats and I invite Professor Hacker to make his presidential remarks and conduct the evolved pr prize proceedings after that. Well, thank you. <clears throat> that was fun, actually. <clears throat> Let me add my welcome to everybody here this evening, the honored guests, our AWOL awardee, our distinguished uh, guests that are here. I want to especially thank those who support our science. We would not be able to do our science without you, so we appreciate that financial support. I personally am delighted to be here with you this evening and to participate in this opening ceremony for the 24th Congress of the International Union of Crystallography. And I want to welcome you to this really magnificent venue. I understand that the official registration, as you heard, it now exceeds over 1,700, with over 73 countries represented. And as you heard, one, 514 crystallographers from India. This is truly an international congress. The local organizers should be congratulated. We'll come to that in just a moment. As we look forward to a busy <clears throat> and exciting week with th three plenaries, 40 keynotes, 
119 micro symposia, posters, commercial exhibits, satellite meetings. We have a busy week ahead of us. In addition, I want to point out the three boxes in the lower part that are highlighted in red, and those are the three evening General Assembly meetings that we have. It takes a lot of work to run the union. This is your union. Many of you contribute to this. There are delegates here that will make decisions about the future of the union, and that business will be conducted during those three evening sessions. Let me just say that it is very fitting that this IUCR Congress be held here in India. India has had an impressive record of contributing to our field of crystallography. This dates from the early work of Banerjee with the structures of naphthalene and anthracene, and as you heard, to the seminal work of Ramachandran, who worked on the triple helical model for the structure of collagen, and of course is well known for his phi psi plot or Ramachandran plot developed in the early 60s. And of course, the contributions of Indian crystallographers continues today. Indeed, many of you in the audience uh, will demonstrate that with your presentations this week. I want to take just a moment to thank several groups. To put a meeting on of this magnitude involves a tremendous amount of work, tremendous amount. I would first like to congratulate those who worked so many months and years to make the educational aspects of this meeting, um, one, a memorial one for all of us. First, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Gautam Desaraju and Professor Ram Jetty and the other members of the local organizing committee shown here. And as they say, great minds think the like. <clears throat> I grabbed the same photo, but I added names. I would ask the local organizing committee to, to rise so we can acknowledge them. So please, please rise. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we could not have a program with so many micro symposia without the input of our International Programming Committee. And you see here <clears throat> the people who put the International Program together. They're scattered throughout the audience, but I would ask them to rise so we can thank them. For the International Programming Committee members, please rise. <clears throat> thank you. Now, the people who are behind the scenes that I'm very grateful for is uh, a two, two groups of people. One of the rewards you have of serving as the president of your international union is you get a chance to meet and work with people who are very dedicated to the union and, and, and serve on that behalf. I would ask all members of the executive committee and the finance committee to please rise so we can thank them for their behind the scenes efforts. Thank you. <clears throat> this last thank you I wasn't sure whether it should come at the beginning of the Congress or at the end, but easily decided it should come at the beginning. And I want to make a special acknowledgement to a very special individual who has been the face of the IUCR Chester office for the past 23 years. Mike Daycomb has been with Chester office since 1975 and has served as our executive secretary of the union since 1993. If you do the math, that means he's helped babysit and guide nine IUCR presidents through the details associated with nine IUCR congresses. Quite an accomplishment. Mike, would you please rise so people can acknowledge you? And I encourage... Mike has decided to retire after this Congress. That's why he's got such a big smile on his face. But I wanted to introduce him at this time because when you see him around the halls this week, please thank him for all his service to the union. I also want to point out that we have a new executive secretary, Alex Ashcroft. Alex, are you there? So I didn't see where you could, if you're here, stand. Well, if you see Alex, welcome him aboard to our group.
Now I'd like to take just a few minutes, especially for the young people and maybe those attending for the first International Congress, to give a little bit of a history lesson and talk a bit about the origin of the Union and the mission. The idea for the creation of the International Union of Crystallography is now 70 years old. Some of us think that's pretty old. Some may think that's not so old. The first Congress was held in 1948 at Harvard University. Tonight, we will honor Sir Tom Blundell with our Awald Prize. Indeed, Awald played a major role in conceiving of the need for an international union and seeing that it became a reality. Since the first Congress at Harvard, there have now been a series of Congresses around the world, as you can see here, and uh, <clears throat> we gather every three years for, our, uh, for one of these meetings. Now, AWALD's motivation for forming an international union that was true back in 1947 still applies today. <clears throat> there was a need to define standards, and he felt that there should be a journal that crystallographers could publish their work. AWALD served as president of the Provisional International Crystallographic Committee from 1946 to 1948, and he chaired the very first Congress where Bragg was elected as our very first president of the Union. Over the past 69 years of the Union, the Union has grown. Oops, did that too soon, sorry. And as you can see in this map, similar to the one that Gautam showed, we now have uh, over six, nearly 60 countries that are rep represented in the Union. The Union is still called upon to establish definitions, establish standards, and has seek to build bridges between those interested in structure and whether it's determined by crystallography or other diffraction means. In 1948, we began our first publication with a single paper journal, Acta Crystallographica. Since that time, we now have a suite <coughs> of nine journals, plus an expanding number of international tables and other published works. As a publishing union, <clears throat> the union is able to serve our community with a number of sponsorships, and those sponsorships primarily include the assisting young scientists to attend meetings. So the more you publish in our journals, the more good works we can do through our sponsorship. So I ask you to please consider publishing in one of our journals and support the union so we can support our young scientists. Now, I do, not <clears throat> excuse me, I do not have time to recount the many contributions that our crystallographic community has made to the benefits of society as a whole. But I would be remiss if I did not remind everyone that just a short three years ago, we celebrated our International Year of Crystallography 2014. There was a grand opening ceremony in Paris in January of 2014 and that was followed by hundreds of events around the world. Later, many workshops, open labs, three summit meetings, all culminating with a closing ceremony in Rabat, Morocco. Now, <clears throat> the work that was done during the international year was ter terrific, and it has left a le lasting legacy that we are trying to continue and promote. So many of the things that were started during the inter international year are still ongoing. I do not have time to detail all of those, but Open Labs would be an example. But I did want to point out one uh, outgrowth of this, and that is the LAMP, Light Sources for Africa, <clears throat> and that, the Americas and Middle East Project. This is the result of a joint proposal between the IUCR and IUPAP that led to the award of an ICSU grant of 300,000 euros to support this project over the next three years. This is exactly the kind of thing that we envision with the seed money we poured into the international year. As we think about better ways to continue these projects and better ways to serve the entire community, we have also introduced an associates program, which we are in launching at this uh, Congress. This is a voluntary membership program that provides benefits to our members but where the dues that are collected are used to support our education and outreach efforts. <clears throat> On the next slide, I'll very briefly list a benefit to the members who join. 
Uh, I urge you to stop by the IUCR booth for more information. I would now like to turn and shift to the main event for the evening, and that is the Awald Prize and our award winner, Sir Tom Blundell. Recall that Paul Peter Awald was instrumental in the formation of the IUCR and helped organize the first IUCR Congress. In 1986, the IUCR established the Ewald Prize in recognition of his outstanding contributions to our science of crystallography. The prize recognizes Professor Ewald's significant contributions to the foundations of crystallography, the, fun the founding of the International Union of Crystallography, and his services as president, both of the provisional uh, committee and later as of, of the union. And he was the first editor of Acta Chris from 1948 to 1959. The prize is now given every three years. And you can see the names of the past awardees. And I highlighted in red that Ramachandran was the awardee in 1999, uh, presented in Glasgow. So that brings us to this evening. And who is the winner? It's not a secret. Our 11th Ewald Prize Award goes to Sir Tom Blundell for his work as one of the worldwide leaders. Yes. I list some of the, some of, just some of the many awards that he has received, but let me just say that the award recognizes him uh, as one of the worldwide wide leaders in the crystallographic innovation especially at the interface with life sciences, starting with his work in determining the structure of insulin with Dorothy Hodgkins. He has since determined an exceptionally broad array of medically critical important human proteins and championing methods for, designing, uh, for drug design and discovery through structural optimization and crystallographic fragment screening and computational modeling. The prize, Tom, if you'll come forward, consists of a medal, a certificate, and a cash prize. I ask Vice President of the Union, Mike Glazer, to join me in making this presentation. In uh, more weighty, weighty prize in more ways than one. I'm now going to turn the podium over to Sir Tom Blundell so we can have his Ewald lecture. Well, uh, Mr. President, Mark Marvin, uh, organizers here led by Gautam and many other friends, I'm absolutely honored and delighted uh, to have this award, especially in India because I first came to India after meeting Siv Ramaseshan, Vijayan, many other distinguished crystallographers, and I came 45 years ago. Several people have asked me, have I been to India before? I'd like to say I've been almost every year and many years more than once, and I'm very, very pleased to be here. I'd also like to just take this opportunity of thanking not only the Executive Committee for nominating me, but also especially Sama Hasnain, who unfortunately can't be here, and Eddie Arnold uh, for writing some very nice things about me in the uh, IUCR newsletter. Thank you to both of them. And I should say, uh, <laughs> I should say uh, that they persuaded me to write uh, a paper for IUCRJ and if you all want to go to sleep now, 
you can go and read the International Union of Crystallography Journal and you'll find some things that I'm going to say. So what am I going to say? I'm going to talk about the contribution, which I think has been very significant, not just for myself, but for many, uh, to not just structural biology, but drug discovery. I believe we've made a major contribution as a community. And my main theme is that that community is not just academics. It's people who also are in industry. And my story is going to be about the exchange, knowledge exchange, as we say, between industry and academia throughout the years. But let me first just say uh, it is fantastic uh, to be awarded the AVOLT Prize and to follow all of these very distinguished people, uh, most of whom I've known over the past, uh, I think it is now uh, 53 years since I first walked into Dorothy Hodgkin's laboratory. And I'm delighted to see people like Michael Rossman, uh, Ramachandran, Michael Wolfson, David Sayre, who all have very close relations with Dorothy Hodgkin. And of course, Eleanor Dodson, who's here in the audience, uh, was a previous AVART Prize winner. We need a few more women recognized here, Executive Committee. <laughs> we need a few more women. This is a science pioneered by women, and in my talk, I'm going to stress the role of uh, one particular woman, uh, Dorothy Hodgkin. This is a picture of her, uh, I think, before I started working with her. But she sums up, uh, for me, everything that's important that I've done in my life in uh, crystallography. But I want to show these crystals of insulin just to make my point about knowledge exchange. Now, many people ask, why did Dorothy Hodgkin uh, start working on insulin? Now, I think it was partly because she was aware that insulin is very important in diabetes. But she was also aware that in industry, they were making crystals. And you know, the most academic book on producing insulin crystals was written by Jürgen Slickro in Novo. And this has been a genuine knowledge exchange. And I will put quite a lot of money on the fact that Dorothy started working on insulin crystals because industry had started working on them and they are used to treat diabetics. So that is the central theme of knowledge exchange. It came with insulin. And Dorothy started that, of course, in the 1930s after she left. And it was very much my fortune that I arrived just in time to participate in the structure of insulin. And I'll tell that story in a little bit more detail. But I want to bring us up to date because although the sequence of insulin was the sequence of a protein determined by Fred Sanger in Cambridge, um, and it had an enormous impact on all of us because we had a protein structure where there was a sequence and that was a huge advantage. We are now revolutionized by the Human Genome Project, uh, which was, of course, completed uh, initially in 2003, and then the huge range of microbacterial and other bacterial infectious disease genomes, which are changing the way we look at medicine. So not only from the human uh, organism, uh, our genes and what's wrong with them, but understanding the genes of infectious agents and turning those using crystallographic expertise into gene products. Because it's the gene products, the proteins, uh, that are important targets. And of course, that's protein crystallography. 
But I'd like to mention, of course, that protein crystallographers now have to learn about small molecules. And crystallography uh, of small molecules becomes very important in drug discovery. So it's a really a bringing together of different themes in crystallography uh, to have new drugs. And I'll tell you about how I participated in uh, various industrial activities since the 1970s, how I formed two companies, the second one, Aztecs, with uh, two others, and I'll tell you about that. And then after 18 years, and in, we borrowed 120 million, and we were invested in another 120 million, uh, we have a drug on the market for breast cancer. So this is a story about crystallography, not thinking about drugs, but really producing drugs by a new methodology that we as crystallographers uh, developed with the help of, of course, many chemists, physicists, computer scientists, and others. So that's a, a summary of where I'm going, but let me start at the beginning, because the beginning was definitely the, the beginning with Dorothy Hodgkin and J.D. Bernal. You see J.D. Bernal here, um, and Dorothy Hodgkin left Oxford in 1932 to go and work with J.D. Bernal in Cambridge, the other place. I started in Oxford, I'm now in Cambridge. And um, Dorothy uh, and Bernal uh, looked at pepsin crystals. These are pepsin crystals, and when they put them in a beam of X-ray, they didn't diffract. But Bernal was a polymath. He worked on water. He knew water was important. And he suggested that if you put your crystals in a water environment and protected them, then they would diffract. And that was the breakthrough in 1934, I think, uh, which led to a diffraction pattern uh, of pepsin. And I'll come back to pepsin, because pepsin is a bit of a dull enzyme. It's involved in your digestion. But I'll show you later how it's important in drug discovery. But I'd like to just draw your attention to this amazing statement that Dorothy Hodgkin and J.D. Bernal made. And that was that now crystalline protein has been made to give X-ray photographs. It's clear that we have a means of checking them. And by examining the structure of the crystalline proteins, arriving at a more detailed conclusions about protein structure than was previously possible. Now, that was an optimistic Bernal and Hodgkin, Crowfoot, of course, at the time, Crowfoot Hodgkin. It took Dorothy Hodgkin 35 years to solve a structure. And of course, it was uh, nearly as long as that before the first protein structure uh, has, uh, was defined. So I want to uh, say a little bit about uh, the lessons learned from this early uh, work. And just to say that Dorothy Hodgkin left uh, Cambridge in, in 1934, and she took with her insulin crystals, which I think Bernal probably arranged to get from uh, industry. I'm not sure of that. But then, of course, she was distracted a little bit. Uh, she solved the structure of penicillin. She solved the structure of vitamin B12. And she got the Nobel Prize. Now, I'd worked in the crystallography department as a, uh, a project student uh, in 1962. Uh, but I walked into the laboratory where Dorothy Hodgkin was working in 1964. And she was on the television on that time, getting the Nobel Prize, fantastic achievement. But where was she? She was in Africa, where her husband, Thomas Hodgkin, was. And that's another theme in crystallography that's relevant. It's one of internationalism. 
So I'm going to tell you about two or three lessons that I learned from Dorothy Hodgkin before I go to talk a little bit more about what I've done. So the first thing is, you have crystals in 1934, you publish a paper, uh, roughly, I think, 1938, on the diffraction pattern, and you have to have perseverance. So from that time, it was until 1969 that Dorothy and her team, and I'll mention the team, but you can see there are a lot of names on the paper at the bottom there, until the insulin team uh, solved the structure of insulin. So my first message is that Dorothy talk us about uh, long-term vision, uh, vision and perseverance. And just to illustrate that, I show a picture of Dorothy Hodgkin a few years after um, the structure of insulin had been solved. I'd like to show you this because you get a feeling uh, of somebody working for a long time on an important project. But as some of you know, I like to show this picture because it shows just how beautiful I was in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, but let me go to the more beautiful people who worked uh, for much longer than I did on insulin. And here's just some of them, not all of them. There's Guy Dodson uh, from New Zealand. There's Eleanor Dodson, she's here from Australia. Uh, uh, there was Margaret Adams from UK. There was uh, Tung Chai, Tung Chai, um, uh, Liang Tung Chai from China, who had been sent to our lab uh, because Dorothy had inspired the Chinese uh, to have a look at the structure of insulin to prove that their synthesis uh, was right. And then there was Vijayan. Of course, I'll say a little bit more about him. He became president of the Indian National Academy. Another person who is here today is uh, Ted Baker. And the point I want to make is really two points. First, it was an international team, and you can see from all different countries. That was quite revolutionary in the 60s. Not every lab was like Dorothy's lab. But the other thing is, it was multidisciplinary. So I learned two things from Dorothy uh, in this respect. One was that science was international, and the other that it had to be interdisciplinary. I think Eleanor, apart from studying English, I think studied mathematics. We had Vijayan, who was a physicist, um, uh, Margaret, who was a chemist, uh, and uh, so on. And um, of course, uh, we had a lot of contributions from emerging computer science, and many of us wrote programs in the 1960s. But we also had a great time. Here's um, Eleanor and Guy uh, at one of the Hersheg meetings uh, up in the Alps, organized by Max Prutz, and uh, the Richard is their son, and uh, Eleanor says, this uh, picture was 1968, uh, so before we solved the structure. But in 1969, we got the structure of insulin, and I'd uh, gone to the International Union of Crystallography meeting in 1969, not expecting to say anything. But as I walked into the meeting with Dorothy Hodgkin, the organizer of the whole meeting came up alongside Dorothy Hodgkin and said, Dorothy, we have not been able to put the moon rock behind a security guard, and therefore the talk we were going to have, the plenary, the first plenary tomorrow, uh, is not possible. We haven't been able to do experiments because it couldn't come uh, outside security. And so he said, Dorothy, would you please give the plenary tomorrow? Because we hear you've just solved the structure of insulin. And Dorothy said, of course, I'd be very happy to do that. She said and paused. And she said, I'll say a few words and Tom can give the lecture. And there I was, age 27, walking in with no slides, uh, a little model of a low resolution structure. I worked all night. And what 
I'm reminded by this screen is, I ended up with three screens. One was an overhead projector, the other was an old lantern slide projector, and the other one was a rather modern projector, and I collected things through the night, made lantern slides, and I got up to give my talk without any preparation. But I had a little trick on Dorothy, because I showed a picture on one slide of the electron density, the second slide of the interpretation, and the third one, I was a jazz musician, I wrote the music that she used to hum when she saw exciting maps. And Dorothy just didn't know she hummed when she was happy, but she was. So that was my lecture, my first uh, plenary lecture uh, at an international union meeting. But of course the international uh, aspect meant that I have friends here in India. Uh, this is Dorothy meeting with Bajan, who unfortunately cannot be here. He was rather unwell, made major contributions here and Siv Ramasation, who was a great inspiration to us all. I met him when he arrived in Oxford to work with Dorothy Hodgkin. Here's a picture of me and Vijayan uh, at um, the railway station. I, I'm uh, a traveler, and uh, this was one of my travels a little bit later than I first came in 72. But what happened in 72 is I also fell in love with Indian culture, and I got interested in the veena. And being a jazz musician, I picked up the veena, took lessons in the veena, and I just show a picture here of, of uh, Krishna Raghavendra, who's still playing now, and just sent me his latest recording over the last day. Um, fantastic music, fantastic science, fantastic people. But also, of course, we kept in touch with China. Here's a picture of Dorothy and myself visiting China. Um, uh, Eleanor, I think, also went and visited. And here we are, posing. You see, I'm still looking fairly beautiful with my long hair. Um, there's um, uh, Professor uh, Tang Yuqi there. And importantly, Liang Tongchai, who'd come to work with us. And then here is me lecturing uh, under a picture of Mao. Everybody was dressed in Mao suits. And uh, I had an interpreter, because in those days, it's different now, of course. Uh, not many people could speak English in Beijing. And we were in Beijing. But then, to my surprise, I was asked to entertain uh, in a different way. And here I am playing a guitar that they found for me. Now, I'm a jazz trumpeter, not a guitarist, but you see they're still smiling, which was rather gratifying. Uh, but the uh, interplay of internationalism, friendship, culture, and music has been dominating for me. So um, that's important. And just another message, and that is I got from Dorothy, is that we should really write up crystallographic methods. Um, Eleanor Dodson, for example, had pioneered many methods of anomalous scattering, but we hadn't really written everything up. And then um, David Phillips arrived in Oxford, and uh, Louise Johnson, a year later, followed. And they'd solved the lysozyme structure. And Louise and I sat down together, and we wrote a book together. And that's the protein crystallography book. And it was one of the best exercises for me, because as I left Oxford, I had to put everything that we knew together. And I'm very pleased that this book went up uh, in price uh, on, on, on um, all these media things to over $1,000. Uh, but there are now some better ones. But nevertheless, I think it was an important thing to write up. So that was lesson three. And lesson four is the one I really want to focus on. And that is that Dorothy Hodgkin, of course, was married to a member of the Communist Party, Thomas Hodgkin. I have to admit, I'd read Thomas Hodgkin's books because I was interested in politics before I knew about Dorothy Hodgkin. I, in the 
late 60s and 70s was a left-wing member of the Oxford City Council, uh, pedestrianizing the center and so on. And I used to sit when I had my first fellowship in Oxford and the fellows used to say to me, why is it that Dorothy Hodgkin, with all her left-wing ideas, goes into companies? And I would explain, well, um, many of her students are there. Many of the best scientists are in companies. And besides that, we need to get insulin from companies, as I said. So I was taken in to Novo, into Wellcome, and into Eli Lilly, uh, and I met people. I became networked. Here was I, a left-wing politician, going in to capitalist institutions and learning about what good science they did. So when I left Oxford, I decided I had to think about something myself. And so I started thinking then about how I could use the knowledge I had. And I read about Wienin, and I realized that Wienin was related to the pepsin that J.D. Bernal and Dorothy Hodgkin had looked at, and also uh, that um, the sequence was available. I built a model of it, and actually my wife, uh, Dr. Bansinali Linsabanda, who's here, um, uh, did most of the modeling, and eventually I got courage to publish it four or five years later, I think, than we originally built it. But then I had a model of a target for drug discovery, which nobody else seemed to have, and I had interest from companies. You know, th over 30 companies uh, gave me 3,000 pounds each for that model in 1980s. I can see, saw the advantage. All the money went into my travel fund, by the way, not personally, uh, and also it was given freely to any academic. Uh, but I suddenly realized that there was a world that was interested in what we were doing. We had the model, we could think about how the ligand bound, um, where the pockets were, and this was one of the early uh, uses of structure-based discovery, uh, which uh, has influenced what I've done for many years. But in parallel to that, in 1978, I've been looking at this pepsin renin molecule, and I thought, gosh, you know, there's something funny about this. If I look at the two halves, this half and this half, they've got the same topology. They're the same fold. Now, you can see that immediately. It took me quite a few months to realize it. And I proposed that there was an ancestor that looked like that. And I published it in Nature in 1978. And every Saturday morning, I went into the library, because no computer library at that time, to look for, does it really exist now? And in 1984, I discovered it in Rouse sarcoma virus, and then immediately realized that it was in HIV. And 1984-85 was when the HIV sequence became available. And you can see this early representation of it doesn't have anything about a protease in it. And, but right in there, just where I'm pointing, I discovered exactly what I was looking for because there was the motif that I recognized from my modeling studies, criticized by some other crystallographers, by the way, and I realized I found what I was looking for. And just imagine the excitement. I got molecules designed for antihypertensives, lowering blood pressure on renin, and I went to Pfizer and I said, I want to uh, meet your people who are going to work on HIV. And, and because I've got this inhibitor. They said, well, what's blood pressure got to do with HIV? I said, well, they have a common uh, enzyme and nobody's realized it. And so what we did is we built models of it. Uh, Lynn here had a large role in that. Eventually, uh, Lawrence Pearl and Willie Taylor published a, uh, a model, but we were working on the crystal structure of this protein. And I realized 
that the protein processes the polyprotein. And if we could block that protein, we would stop the development of AIDS. And so uh, it took us five years, a lot less, to get the structure. So now we're in academia, and I was beaten by two weeks or three weeks by my very, very close friend, Alex Vladova. And so we both published in Nature on the target protein. But then I was called by Margaret Thatcher, of all people, our right-wing prime minister, to go and advise her. And the company I'd set up to design a ligand for this by a fabricer, um, I had to close because they said, you can't be a civil servant and uh, a, a company person. And uh, others, uh, thankfully, went on very quickly. And in 1995, we got the first drug, not me, but in industry, so this was exchange of knowledge um, for HIV. And then we learned a lot of new things because that uh, new drug, of course, uh, led to um, uh, resistance. And there were mutations all over the place. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But I better move on because what this told me was that if I knew the sequence uh, of a gene product that was going to make a, uh, a drug target, and then I could design something to it, then I could make new drugs in a very effective way. And many people then began to call this uh, exploring biological space, going from the genome to the gene product, and then exploring chemical space by going from the gene product through to the chemical. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how we've developed that. But in the meantime, we've been working on in I worked on glucagon. Um, I started to look at the complexity of systems. I worked on nerve growth factor, another area where Alex Vadova was going, in parallel to doing the drug discovery. But this showed that these molecules were a lot more complicated than renin and HIV. You could see these nerve growth factor structures, many of which we solved in the 80s and 90s, uh, were really quite complicated. And then when I got to fibroblast growth factor, I found, although many people said it was a dimer active, I found it was really a very complex array of multi-protein system. Um, I published it in Nature in 2000. Uh, about half of the more than 1,000 uh, references to it are critical of what I said, but I still believe that it is a very complex multi-protein system. So in drug discovery, I also realized I needed to understand and define complexity. And this led me into thinking how we define these multi-protein complex systems. And so just let me take one, DNA double strand break repair, where you double uh, break a, a, two, a duplex of DNA quite complicated, it actually involves around 10 structures. We use small angle X-ray scattering. We use computing as well. I always write, uh, I have my group, and I used to write computer programs uh, about this. We predicted a new component of this. Um, and then Lynn, who's in the audience here, and Dima Chagadze uh, solved the structure uh, which we published at low resolution in, 19, in 2010, and then just this February, to bring you right up to date, we published in Science uh, the complete chain tracing of this molecule. But at the same time, we realized we've got to go into cryo-EM. Cryo-EM is changing all of our lives, and you're going to hear great talks in this meeting about what's been happening. But we also need to know things about nanospray mass spectrometry to understand the complexity. And so these are the methods. We can't just be X-ray crystallographers. We have to do a range of biophysical methods because these systems are complex. But we do do some interesting crystallography. Here is Lynn's DNA PK. Uh, and this has got 4,000 amino acids, a repetitive sequence, and Lynn made in uh, HeLa cells uh, um, methionine, selenomethionine substituted form, 
We had two molecules in the asymmetric unit to get to some crystallography. So 8,000 amino acids in the, uh, in the asymmetric unit, and we labeled it with selenomethionine, and Lynn followed the selenomethionines through uh, as we went. Uh, and, and that's how the structure was solved. We had two molecules, so we could check that they were pretty okay. So 200 and, and something uh, selenomethionines through anomalous scattering. This is an anomalous scattering map. So, and then what do we get out of it? Well, we get some biology. You can see these DNA PK molecules hold the ends of the DNA uh, together and allow a number of other components, the ligase and so on, to come in and mend the ends. So that's how complexity leads us to all sorts of things. We have to store that information, so we've developed lots of databases, all freely accessible, uh, where we can relate small molecule binding to large structures, um, and also in the Kemble uh, database with lots of drugs in it. And then we build from the human uh, genome, the mycobacterial genome, we build models of the proteome so that if you do screening of them, we already have an idea of what the structure is. Now, you might say, you're a crystallographer. Why the hell are you model building? Well, the answer is that we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on just mycobacterium tuberculosis, and we only know 10% of the gene products in three dimensions. So you need to have crystallography, but you need to have modeling. I think that message finally got through. And what we do is to take software that we've written in my group over the years. The best known one is probably Modeler, which has 9,500 citations written by Andre Shelley in one year as a PhD student in my lab and then sequence structure homology recognition in Fugue, and we take those and we put them in a pipeline, and then we generate models of the proteome for various infectious agents. So if you're doing a phenotypic screen, that means you're sharing small molecules at a thing like uh, tuberculosis, you don't know what the target's going to be, so you have to have some knowledge, whatever you can get about every target. And we look at target uh, ability to drug ability and so on. And then we've written a lot of software, substitution tables turned into statistical potential energy functions uh, to understand mutations and which ones are going to be causing disease or resistance. And we've used machine learning, so all the modern techniques we bring in. So in my lab, I have an experimental multi-protein system. I have a computational biology group, and we also have uh, drug discovery. And this is Douglas Pyrrhus and David Asher. I think we published 20 papers in the last two or three years on genetic disease like this carcinoma. So just knowing the structures, predicting them, looking at the interactions, we can begin to understand how mutations affect things. But that's all exploring biological space. What about the chemical space? So there, of course, we began to screen with huge libraries of a million compounds in the 1990s. No longer doing what I've been doing in the 70s and 80s, taking the substrate and modifying it. We had big libraries, we had to cope with that. But then that didn't seem to really be succeeding very well. Productivity, number of new FDA approvals didn't increase. And so we began to think in the late 90s how we could use crystallography in a more efficient way. And this is called structure-guided, fragment-based drug discovery. And we take tiny fragments, we decrease the complexity, decrease the size of the library, and we screen, and we, but we have to use biophysical methods, including crystallography, to see where these very fragments, these small fragments go. You see, this one is just bound. It's a tiny fragment. It wouldn't have much effect, usually. But then we get the chemist in, and we all sit around the computer graphics, and we start modifying it. And that was the idea we had of a company. And uh, from another, I depended on two students. So the first student was Haran Jyoti, from the Punjab originally, but brought up in the UK. 
and he was really the major driver of this. He and I sat in our, our room. He was in GSK. We sat in our spare room and planned the company. We realized we needed a chemist, so we then recruited Chris Abel, who's now the Pro Vice Chancellor in uh, Cambridge. And we then went to another one of my students. So Haran Jyoti was my student in the 1980s. I then went to another student in the 1970s who was an entrepreneur and venture capitalist. And I borrowed from him half a million dollars. He was very skeptical. He said, the only reason I'm giving you this money, Tom, is because at the end of the year, you'll realize you, it wasn't a good idea, but you'll have another idea. I want to tell everybody that um, 18 years later, I'm still doing the same thing, and it's worked. But we started off with three people in my lab, and Haran came out of GSK, where he was working, and we then showed that this idea of sw using small fragments would work. And we then raised a lot of money. So what we did is we went to various people. We got um, $20 million investment. We uh, took uh, the two or three people from my lab and Chris's lab. We moved them up the road onto the science park and then started expanding. After a few years, we built a, a new uh, company building, and this housed around 120 people. But what we did is just take our academic lab, chemistry lab, and the biology lab, with a few other things, and put them on the science park. But what I did, what we did, was to employ lots of people from the pharmaceutical industry, so we weren't just dealing with academics. And then we started to work. I, by the way, was a chicken. I stayed in academia, but I chaired the Science Advisory Board. I was on the main board, and we pioneered it. So what did we do? Here it is. We get a molecule. We crystallographically screen. We get a molecule which binds like that. That's just millimolar, so that's not a drug. We then get the chemist in. We look and say, hey, there's lots of space here. We can optimize this. Let's make it, do you want to go there or there or both places? And eventually you see you go down to nanomolar and then you keep going. And in the company, we've done this 30 times. And on the average, we can get a nanomolar drug, uh, nanomolar drug, a nanomolar lead, I should say, or a candidate uh, in about uh, half a year or just more and you get something that begins to have nanomolar binding. So that's a long story. Uh, a few years later, um, we had 10 drugs. Well, I think at this time we had eight drugs in clinical trial, um, many of them going further along. And then we realized we were running out of money. So we then had to go back uh, to find out what to do. Now, what I didn't want to happen was to be bought by a GSK, a Pfizer, or AstraZeneca, I'm afraid, because what they do is they, they buy you up, they asset strip you, and they close you down. I wanted a family company, and we got a beautiful family company, and we got it from Japan. And in uh, 2013, we sold the company for a small amount, $886 million, um, I should say we borrowed 120 million, we'd had another 120 million given us. Most of that money went to the investors, not to the founders. But nevertheless, it was great uh, to find that we were wanted. We have a very sympathetic, fantastic company in Otsuka, uh, based in Japan. I love that because I lived in Japan a bit, can speak, I've even been giving Japanese lectures recently. And um, then uh, in March, or, or November last year, we um, got through phase three. We got our first drug through there. And just this March, we got FDA approval. But just think, 18 years to get one drug on the market. We've got another 10 in clinical trials, but it takes a long time. It needs time and perseverance and patience. So that's in industry. And let me very quickly now say, what would I do? Because industry won't do everything. So what we thought was, what could we do back in academia? 
And we could do neglected diseases because no company seems to work on those. They don't give you enough profit. Or could we work on very difficult targets? So we thought, for various reasons, let's try both. And Bill Gates, uh, an amazing guy, um, he, uh, and I should say, it, it was really Melinda Gates who got Bill interested in infectious disease and led to the foundation of the Gates, uh, or the Gates Foundation, in fact. And um, that was important to us. Um, Bill thought we could get a drug in a short time. It was obviously going to take a bit longer. I got involved in this not because it was just in southern Africa. Um, it was because of Bill and Melinda Gates. However, uh, our family is part of Africa. So this is my wife here, Dr. Sivanda, in her African name. My two children, who are very lucky to be in Europe. Um, that's um, uh, Klesi and Lisa. They have African names, by the way. And here are, uh, are my grand nephew and niece. And here's the beautiful country. And this is where people are compromised through AIDS. People in the family uh, can die and have died of AIDS. We've had two or three people with tuberculosis. It's a real challenge that suddenly becomes personal. So what we did is we told Bill Gates, we can't do it in the company, we'll spin it back to academia. And that's what we did. And we looked at the first line drugs and the second line drugs, and we chose some of these. Um, and this one is ETHA, which is activated by ETHR. I'm not going to go into the biochemistry of this. And then in academia, so I learned from industry. I took from industry, and in Cambridge, of all places, I started doing what industry had taught me and started doing drug discovery uh, on something that they couldn't get funding for. And so we do an initial screening. Look, an international team here. Um, we do an initial screening using x-rays and thermal shift and other methods. Here are some of the biophysical methods that we use. This was led by Sachin uh, Saradi at the time, a very clever Indian who's now in company. Um, we then uh, test our fragment hits. We do the crystal structure of every one of them. And look at this. This is an array of fragments. You can see the drug just sitting there. And you can design it even if you're not a skilled chemist designer, I'm sure. And then Bill came. I got a phone call from Seattle saying Bill Gates wanted to come and see us. He said, don't for God's sake, well, it was Ken Duncan who actually said, don't for God's sake uh, tell uh, anybody in Cambridge because they're hijacked Bill and he's coming on his own. So he came and you can see him walking up the steps to my lab. And this is Chris Abel, this is Bill Gates in the middle. Uh, one photographer already found out, but there weren't the masses you'd get if it had been publicized. And then we made him put a lab coat on and we took him around the lab and everybody was invited to say, first, what is your first subject? Mathematician, physicist, chemist, biologist, medic, or, and what is your first language? And we could do 37 languages in my group, really multidisciplinary. And here's Bill challenging one of my students. He's saying, he's saying um, I can see the drug. Well, you can't see it here, but it's just there on the screen. He said, but what about the waters? Bill Gates invests in water companies. He said, well, what about the waters? And my student, very bright, said, well, Mr. Gates, he said, I removed the waters so you could see our candidate drug. And Bill seemed to be happy. And we went ahead using the normal techniques of bioassays, cheminformatics, and with Chris Abel, have got lead compounds. We've done that on 10, 12 compounds uh, now. And then uh, that was neglected diseases. At about the same time, another thing happened, and that was that the Wellcome Trust sold their shares in the Wellcome Foundation. They couldn't invest in biomedicine properly because they had a conflict of interest. They would lose their charity status. And suddenly they had the idea of selling all their shares 
in what was then not Glaxo Welcome, uh, it was GSK, and then they were free. And they made a huge investment, an amazingly well thought out investment. And suddenly the money available from the Wellcome Trust increased, and they were willing to work on drug discovery. And so they came and asked me, what would you do, uh, which wasn't going to happen in industry. And I said, well, obviously infectious disease, but what about uh, very difficult targets? And so in 2006, they put some money into my lab. And so what I do is I take a topic that I've taken in my basic science lab. So here is RAD51. RAD51 is involved in DNA repair by homologous recombination. I'm not going to go into that, but what we've done is in 2002, published a paper, full article in Nature, uh, about this. And I pointed out that the interaction between BRCA2, which is a breast cancer-related uh, gene, and uh, RAD51, which is carried by BRCA2 into the nucleus, um, involve these two little pockets. And these two little pockets that you see circled, they are not druggable. I sent it as a grant application to a number of different people, and all these wise bodies, full of experts, said this target is undruggable, and we're not going to fund it. But the Wellcome Trust said, okay, try, after I've been trying for some time. So what we did is we... Uh, took this target, you, you can see it here, uh, hopefully emerging. So this is the crystal structure, the RAV51, and the BRCA2 folds onto it and occupies those two little pockets. And that's a conserved region. We knew it was important. And so we then work with my co-collaborator uh, um, uh, on the Nature paper to work out an assay for it. So we worked out cell assays. You have to do lots of different things. And then what happened is we started doing the crystallography. Now, the referee said it was undruggable. We couldn't do anything. I want to tell if any of those referees are in my audience, we have 740 crystal structures and dozens of them with fragments, and we were able to use crystallography uh, to design better molecules with the aid of chemists and computer scientists, of course, and we got a nanomolar molecule. It took rather longer than it did for the classical kinases in the company, but we got there. So what in academia we can do is to challenge the norms and try to uh, introduce new methods using sometimes old uh, techniques, and it's multidisciplinary. The challenge we have now is resistance. I'm not going to go into this, but my lab over the last two years has been writing a lot of software, and we have been very dependent on computer scientist Douglas Pyrrhus and uh, crystallographer David Asher and have developed a thing called MCSM LIG. And what we do there is use machine learning to predict the effects of mutations on drug resistance. And um, we exploit uh, a database that David developed. The trouble is having good students, these two guys, only after being uh, two or three years in my lab and now have professorships in Brazil, in Belo Horizonte, and in uh, Melbourne, so they're now developing their own work. But what we've been able to show is that although much resistance comes from molecules which um, uh, residues, uh, you see that's a resistance residue, this is a dimeric structure, which are close to the substrate, many mutations come from distance. So you can't just look at a sequence and look at where the ligand is to know whether which residue is going to form resistance, and then to use crystallography and other methods to design new drugs. And so this is an example of, of resistance. So here is the, if I can get this, here's the substrate, and these mutations are not affecting directly the drug binding, but they're affecting through allosteric interactions through interfaces. So we have a new understanding. Now, the University of Cambridge 
Uh, I fought against, by the way, racism, gender bias. My big battle now is ageism. Uh, I'm eight years past retirement age and fighting the university. But nevertheless, I hope in the next uh, five, ten years to really think about how we can uh, now design new drugs using the sort of methods that I've been describing to make new molecules. So we have ideas, of course, about using structure and crystallography for repurposing drugs, but also we have some much more way out ideas about fragmenting the drugs and reconstructing them uh, to be useful new medicines. So that's the challenge for us all for the next decade, that we haven't finished this, lots more to do. But you got my message, I hope. You need a beautiful group. You need at least half women. I can see half the women, half my team are women. Uh, a few more women uh, need to be recognized. We need to have people from all over the world working together and understanding each other. And we need to have mathematicians, physicists, chemists, biologists, and medics all working together like you've seen in the team in the future. And that is my story. It's a story influenced by crystallography and very much dependent still on Dorothy Hodgkin and her um, thoughts about how we could use crystallography in a useful way. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Accomplishments. Obviously, another great selection for an AWOLD award winner. I do not think we have time for questions. I'm sure there are hundreds of those, but we have more to do with the program. So let's thank uh, Sir Tom Blundell once again for his presentation. Get on. I would now like to uh, call Dr. Ram Jetty back to the podium to continue the program for this evening. Professor Hackard, now we come to the cultural event of the opening ceremony. This evening we have a very short vocal classical music performance by the Maladi brothers, Sri Rama Prasad and Ravi Kumar. The Indian classical music tradition is a unique one and has a melodic structure based on musical forms called ragas. The Indian musical tradition bifurcated around 800 years ago into the North Indian or Hindustani stream or the South Indian or the Carnatic stream. The Malladi brothers are top perform performing artists in the country and their music is known for a very high level of rigor and classism. They are accompanied today by Satyanarayana Sarma on the violin, Tumkur Ravishankar on the Mridangam, Ramnamurti on the Gatam, Srinivas Gopalan on Morsing, and Sai Chand on Tambura.
start our concert with the composition of Tyagaraja Swami in Ragam Husseini Settu Adi Talam. Sri Karna, 
corresponding to C major in Western music. This is set to Mishra Chapu Talam. This has seven beats. And this composition is in Sanskrit language. The Swaras goes like this. Sa Re Ga Ma Pa Da Ni Sa Sa Ni Da Pa Ma Ga Re Sa Other Mm-hmm. 
gamari maga gamari gari 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 gari
composition of Sri Talapaka Annamacharya in Ragam Hindustani Kalavati this composer has sung more than 32,000 compositions in praise of Lord Venkateshwara or Balaji at Thirmala Kandarpa Janaka Garuda Gamana Kandarpa Janaka Garuda Gamana Nanda Gopatma Janamo Namo Namo Kandarpa Janaka Garuda Gamana Nanda Gopatma Janamo Shyama Shastri in Ragam Punna Gavarali. This composition is in praise of Goddess Kanchi Kamakshi.
ಕನಕಶೀಲ ವಿಗಾರಿ ಕನಕಶೀ wonderful concert mini concert this evening thank you very much
I suppose many of you recognized that the music is highly improvisatory and nearly I would say 85 to 90 percent of what Sri Ram Prasad and Ravi Kumar have conveyed to us this evening was improvised on the spot. Thank you. And this includes, this includes the percussive elements that you have heard. See, this is, this is not in that sense rehearsed. Yes, there is a music that has been written, as they said, about 250 years ago in most of these cases. But that is the bare bones. And as Dr. Jetty said, the raga form or the musical form is what they try to convey. <coughs> Today through Husseini, Shankara Barnam and Punagavarali. The same ragam sung by the same artist on different days sounds different. It is the mood. Ragam means mood. And so it is a particular mood that is sought to be conveyed. And I don't know, each person in the audience may feel different about it, but today what I felt throughout this little concert, it's a very little concert, was a certain softness went through the whole room. I, I really felt it. Because these same compositions can be sung and they sound sometimes different from what they sung today. But the primary element that came to my mind was a certain softness. Even in the second major composition, which is supposed to be very, very rigorous. In, I told them, Tom, by the way, I told them about the Evolved Prize. And I said that uh, this is a crowd of people from 73 countries. I told them a bit about you. I didn't know that you had learned to play the veena till yesterday in a vainika. And Nerchukun uh, Arakuda. And I told them that uh, this was a collection of top scientists. And in fact, the Ravi, with whom I spoke on the phone, he said, well, what are we supposed to sing? How can we convey what we are doing? So I said, many of them don't even know about India. They don't know about music, certainly not Carnatic music, or about you. But one of the things about the IUCR Congress is its search for quality, quality, quality all the time. And I told them that you would be giving this Eval lecture and I challenged them. I said, now you sing something which is as good as his lecture, maybe better even. So they said, now you're <laughs> making life difficult for us. And some of you know, of course, that the typical concert, Carnatic music, it used to be, I guess in Dr. Chidamaram's time, even maybe four hours and more. By the time I started listening to Carnatic music in the late 60s, it started coming down to three and then even two and a half. Today, about two and a half is the norm. So then Ravi told me, he said that what we have to do in two and a half hours, you are trying to ask us to convey in half an hour. This is very difficult. Then I told him that in our business, everything becomes smaller. The computers, the diffractometers, it is mini miniaturization all the way. And it's a test of somebody's ability to convey the same thing in a shorter and shorter and shorter period. And those of you who listen to Carnatic music or even Hindustani music for that matter would appreciate that they have certainly done that this evening. This, there is no doubt about that. And if I may say so, the Congress, therefore, begins with a very happy augury. And the immortal music of Tyagaraja Swami 
Muthu Swami Dikshitar and Shama Sastri have wafted th through this room and I suppose they will through the whole Congress indeed for the next seven days. Meer andaro, pakkavadhyala andaro, bhakti to spashtanga paadi naro, me mandaro trupti purnanga vinnam. Chana chana thanks. Now we come to the end of the opening ceremony and I invite all of you to move to the exhibition area for a social mixer and look forward to seeing you in the scientific session which begin tomorrow morning at 8, 9 a.m. Thank you all very much. <laughs>